All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I am a Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google here in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hours Hangouts, where webmasters and publishers can join in and ask questions around web search and the website. Um, as always, it looks like a bunch of questions were submitted. Uh, but if any of you want to get started with the first question, you're welcome to jump in now. I would like to ask a question. Right. Uh, yeah, it is about the geo blocking because uh, we have a web page which has a lot of video and programs um, which we are only allowed to show um, in our country. So we have geo block. So if people come outside, um, they actually redirect it to a page where. Um, it says that they can watch uh, this program. And also, if you enter the front page, you can only see content which yeah, you're able to watch. So my question is whether we can whitelist Google crawlers, or that is a no-go, or how we yeah, can yeah. fix that. Um, so in general, you should treat Googlebot the same as any other user from the same region. So. Since we mostly crawl from the US, mm -hmm. you would need to treat Googlebot like, like another user from the US. Uh, that's a bit, I don't know, problematic in, in some cases, um, because the, the other way around would be no problem. If you have a website in the US and you say, I want to block users in Europe, then that would be no problem. But mm -hmm. if you're a website in Europe and you want to block users in the US, then you would be blocking Googlebot as well. Yeah. So that's not really something that, that you can get around there, uh, or at least according to our guidelines. Uh, what you can do for video content in spe specifically is specify which countries the content is available for. Uh, so what you could do, theoretically, is make it so that the HTML pages are accessible by users everywhere and that the videos only play in, in the appropriate countries. And the video files, those are things that you can uh, show to Googlebot, even though users in the US would not be able to see it, because you can specify the limitations with, with markup. Yeah. OK, but it is a no-go to actually whitelist. Um... Yeah. Yeah. OK, cool. I, sh yeah. I just wanted to make sure, because that was the easiest <laughs> workaround. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. I I think from from a web spam point of view, the the web spam team would probably not take action on that. Uh, but uh, according to our guidelines, that that would not be appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any other questions before we jump into the submitted ones? Hey John, I have a question. Uh, the thing is, we have a main domain redirect. Uh, so will it affect uh, my data in Search Console? How, how do you mean uh, main domain redirect? Yeah. Say example.com slash. It is redirected yeah, to the example.com slash en. Mail, so should okay. I have to change my main domain in the Search Console? So Oh, no, that's, that's perfectly fine. If, if you're redirecting to a lower level page on your domain, then you can keep the, the whole domain in Search Console. You can, if you want, just verify the subdomain or subdirectory, but you don't need to. OK, so if verifying two domains, will it like my data will be uh, available in both the uh, domains? Yes. yes. OK, thanks. Sure. All right. Let's jump into some of the submitted questions. Uh, as always, sorry, if sorry, John. Hello. Yeah. Hello, okay. Everyone. One more before we go. Okay. Sure. Thanks. So uh, I asked uh, the question on the Masters Help community. Uh, the question is about Google Search Console. Uh, in the old version of Google Search Console, we had a great way to discover uh, blocked resources. Uh, now, uh, as I understand, in the new one, we have the URL inspection tool, uh, the help center. Uh, suggest uh, use this tool if you want to discover blocked resources. So when I use test my site tool, I use uh, I see blocked resources, but I can't find the same data in 
URL inspection tool in Search Console. Well, I wonder why, and also wasn't it uh, better to provide uh, the information about uh, blocked resources uh, for all sites, not on a single URL basis? Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a good request. So we, I think we we dropped that feature because we noticed that most sites were no longer running into problems with that, um, because we, with the shift to to mobile friendliness. Uh, that that was a big problem. If a URL, if a resource was blocked from crawling with robots text, then sometimes we can't tell if a page is mobile friendly. Uh, but that has improved significantly across the web. So we decided to drop that feature. Uh, but uh, it's it's good to hear feedback that uh, it was actually useful. So <laughs> I'll I'll definitely pass that on to the team. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't have any workaround at the moment to, to get a, a broader list of all of the blocked resources. OK, thanks. Sure. Hello, John. How are you? Hi. Yeah, uh, John, I have a question uh, regarding the uh, Webmaster Office hours, which was streamed live on November 2018. Oh, gosh. So, uh, and, yeah, it was uh, way, way ago. So. Yeah, so in that uh, in that session, you mentioned that uh, the discovered but not indexed thing, uh, which are uh, which will not happen because the pages are duplicate, right? Or maybe the pages have the same theme, and they are but they are having different content. But once the Google will crawl, you know, a thousand pages, then Google will get to know. Uh, right now, this website has the same design, same uh, you know, same uh, way of content uh, content showing on the website, so. I mean, uh, in this way, uh, you mentioned this. If we are using the script-based title and meta description uh, automation, if we are putting the title and meta description using the scripts, right? We are using the, uh, for example, we have. Uh, I mean, right now we have two lakh pages, two hundred thousand pages. Right now we have on our website, and we are using script automation by putting the Google uh, like meta tags, uh, metadata, all tags, and everything. Metadata, everything. We are using the, this uh, script basis automation. So you mentioned that uh, uh, it is not a good practice. And my question is: In the Magento, when uh, when people are uploading Excel sheets, right? So that is also a kind of automation because they are updating their metadata by using the Excel. So how Google is reacting towards the Magento websites and how Google is reacting to the custom-based websites which are using the script-based automation. OK. Um, I, I think those are two, two quite different things. So I, I think yeah. what you're referring to is uh, the, the Google tag, using Google Tag Manager to edit titles and descriptions? No, no. We are, we are actually not using Google Tag Manager right now. We are just using GTM only for the uh, schema-based variable creation thing. So we are just using the script-based automation for our metadata. In this way, what we are doing is we are just putting, you know, uh, um, in the Excel, we do concatenation, right? So the concatenation process, we are just using the script for that on our website. So every time when we upload, for example, 50,000 more pages, for our uh, like for our website, so we have a template. We upload that template again. Then every page has its own meta tag, alt tag, and everything. So because uh, right now we have you know products, we have different. We have different content. We have different fact pages on our page, uh, different different pages. But still, our indexing is not improving. I mean, my question, uh, my main question is: Is it because of the design? Is it because of the automation? Is it because of the script? I mean, what what could be the reason? Because right now we are doing everything. Uh, I mean, at our end, we are we are trying to keep unique content on our website. We are doing doing everything. I mean, you know, in a best way. But still, we are uh, facing this problem in the indexing way. So we have like twenty eight thousand pages indexed only on. So okay. that's why. Yeah. Okay. So. I, I think there are, there are a few aspects that, that might be confusing and being mixed up. Um, mm -hmm. I, so, so in general, when, when, when you say you're using a script-based approach there, it sounds like you're, you have the scripts running on the server. It's yes. not, not, it's, uh, it's not, not on JavaScript. The server. Yeah. 
it's not yeah. on the server uh, sorry to interrupt you but it's not on the server but uh, once we before uploading the website live what we do is we have the developer version of our website what we do is we upload our data on the developer version and then the developer what they do is they upload that version on live live server okay. yeah. so we are not actually you know creating the uh, script based thing on live website so okay. we are doing our, on our like you know before version you can say the first version of the website yeah, so, yeah. okay so so i think in, in general you you wouldn't need to worry about the script part because okay. it it sounds like I, I don't remember the that that particular hangout, so yeah. it, it's been quite a while. Uh, yeah. But uh, w one of the things we have talked about is using JavaScript to update yeah. titles and descriptions, and that mm -hmm. would be something very different from what you're doing. So it sounds like okay. you're uploading things, and then you have a script that processes them, and then you upload that to the server, and yeah. uh, that's that results in normal HTML pages being uploaded to your website, which yeah. we can process completely normally. So that's very different from using JavaScript that runs mm -hmm. in a browser to update the titles and the descriptions. Okay. Uh, so from that point of view, I, I think you're fine. Um, I, I think the, the general problem that you're seeing is just that you have a lot of pages, and only a part of them are being indexed. Yeah. And that's something that can be quite normal. It can also be a sign that maybe there are some technical issues there. Uh, what I would recommend doing is posting that maybe in the Webmaster Help Forum and okay. having some other people double check your site and just kind of give you some general advice. It could okay. be, it could be that, uh, for example, that we're just not convinced about the quality of the website. It mm -hmm. could be that there's a technical issue that's blocking us from crawling these pages completely. Um, but it's it's very hard to say just off the hand. I I think. In general, the approach that you have with uploading your content with an Excel file and your server generates pages out of that, that's that's perfectly legitimate. That's something that yeah. a lot of sites do. Yeah, because uh, I mean, uh, when I check the Magento uh, processing, uh, when I check the R website, so we are using uh, PHP. Uh, Magento is also on PHP. So Magento is right now moved to React JS on in 2.3 version so they have some different things but right now um, i was just confused like if uh, we are doing the automation process in magento then i mean how could it harm to our website in the custom way yeah, so that 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 was I, my I, th I think from from the automation that you're doing with with uploading the information with a sheet that's yeah. that's perfectly fine that's not okay. not an issue uh, okay. and magento is, is a fairly big platform uh, yeah. in that a lot of sites use it. So if there were a general problem with Magento, oh. I think that would be very visible. And it would be yeah. something that they would fix very quickly. So Yeah, they do that, yeah. Yeah, so I, I would just try to get advice from, from other people, specifically for your website, okay. and see if there's something small that maybe you can change, or maybe you, you have to kind of find other approaches to, to make the website work better. OK, sure. I'll get it done on Google Webmaster Forum. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Hi, John. All right. Do you mind if I ask a question? Sure. Go for it. Um, so I'm working with a site at the moment. They have actually posted this on uh, the forum. It, so what's happening is we've got a bunch of pages that are now indexed. They then get the no index gets removed, gets introduced to the sitemap. They then throw a load of errors in Search Console that they're in the sitemap but no indexed. If you hit the revalidate button, it just says it just it checks a few and then says it that they're no indexed still. It, it seems to me that the, the the revalidate button doesn't work, or because they, we can go through them and there's definitely no X robots header or tagging the head of the page, but it still just keeps throwing this error. And we wondered if. So, so the pages are not no indexed, or they are? They, they previously were no indexed. It, it's a user generated site. So the, the no index gets removed when the content reaches a certain threshold, i.e., if it's had enough engagement. They then get put in the sitemap. And at that point, they error in Search Console saying that they're no indexed but in the XML sitemap. So then there's like 2,000 of them at the moment. But 
you can click the revalidate button and it just says no they're still no indexed even though they're definitely not okay I, I suspect what's happening there is that Search Console is a little bit faster than the, the rest of indexing, which, which is surprising sometimes. Uh, uh, but uh, what, what's probably happening is we're seeing that these pages are no indexed, and mm -hmm. Search Console recognizes that they're in the sitemap file because th that's where they are now. Yeah. And then Search Console will, will throw an error. So, so basically, we're taking the old status of the no index pages and yeah. seeing that they're now in a sitemap file and thinking, oh, you added no index pages to the sitemap file. And we, we haven't actually reprocessed the individual pages since you've added to them to the site. Right. So does the revalidate button not actually go off and recrawl all of those pages? Um, revalidate, is that, is that in the index status, or is that the sitemap? Um, no, it's, it's like a, so you, go in, you can go into Search Console. You pick the section of errors that you've got, in this case, in sitemap, but no index. And there's just a button that says revalidate. And it, it from what I understood, it goes off and rechecks all those pages. But yeah. it doesn't seem to do that, from what I can tell. Um, it should. It should. The, the idea there is that it, it checks a sample of the pages first. Right. Um, I, I think maybe like five or 10 pages and double checks that the error is, is resolved. And then it'll trigger a reprocessing of the rest of the pages there. Um, I, I'm not 100% certain how it would handle the situation where you have the sitemap file in between, if it just revalidates that these URLs are in the sitemap file or not, or right. if it actually okay. recrawls the, the URLs themselves. But I, I can double check with, with the team on that. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let me run through some of the questions that were submitted, because people spent a lot of time pushing them in there. So we should get through some of those. Um, what could be a reason uh, that a huge listing, very popular site, not being switched to mobile-first indexing? Um, Essentially, we, we have multiple classifiers that try to understand when a site is ready for mobile-first indexing. Uh, and usually what, what we've seen with larger sites is not so much that uh, we'd say, this is an important site. We'll switch it over quickly. But rather, we'll switch it over when we think it's ready. And with larger sites, what often happens is there are multiple sections of the site that use slightly different setups. Uh, so that's something that. That happens quite a bit, where you have maybe multiple CMSs involved or multiple backends and front ends involved within the same domain. And uh, it can happen that maybe some of those systems are not ready for mobile-first indexing, according to our classifiers, and others are. And in a case like that, we'll hold off and wait a little bit to kind of make sure that everything is really ready. Uh, also, with really large sites, what we've started doing is uh, shifting a handful of URLs over to mobile-first indexing, uh, maybe 1%, maybe a few percent, and seeing how, how the site generally performs. Are they seeing that uh, indexing is working well with mobile-first indexing for that site? And if so, we'll ramp that up slightly. Uh, so all of those things are, are aspects that you might be seeing there with mobile-first indexing. Uh, I wouldn't see it as, as a sign that anything is broken or wrong if your site is not switched to mobile-first indexing yet. Uh, it might just be that our classifiers are still a bit cautious and try to stay on the safe side. Uh, the meta tags, keywords, and news keywords aren't used anymore, I believe. However, I see a lot of publishers are still using it. Uh, is it just redundant? Uh, should we use them, essentially? Um, we don't use them at all for, for search. So you don't need to do, use them. But they, at the same time, they also don't cause any problems. Uh, I've used the, the keywords meta tags for, for my own sites just as a way to help me kind of focus on a specific topic so that I know what I want to write about on a specific page. And that's more for myself and not something that search engines would really care about. Uh, so. Maybe others are doing that too. Uh, but again, this is something that uh, essentially is not 
not something that you'd, you'd need to fix or change. It's just we, we ignore them. If you want to provide them, if your systems provide them automatically, no problem. Um, I recently uncovered a big canonicalization issue on a large-scale site where many pages were incorrectly being canonicalized to other pages with non-equivalent content. Google was simply ignoring the rel canonical, which makes sense. Now I'm surfacing more examples across the site of Google ignoring rel canonical, uh, also where it makes sense. Uh, this got me wondering that if Google sees the wrong canonical tags on a site often, uh, if it then starts to not trust the user-selected canonical URLs across the whole site, and if it does lose trust, then maybe Google systems think it's better to select canonical URLs across the site on its own versus using the canonical tag. Uh, do you know if that's the case? Uh, so it's, it's theoretically possible that we, we ignore the canonical tag across the whole site, but I think that would be extremely rare. Uh, because that would generally be something that, that our engineers would have to do pretty much manually. Uh, what, what usually happens is with, with the canonical, uh, rel canonical tag, is that we do this on a per page basis. And on a per page basis, we, we use a number of factors that come into canonicalization, including the rel canonical. Uh, including information about the URL, about uh, the content, about other URLs that have the same content. And we try to pick a canonical based on all of those factors. And uh, the rel canonical alone isn't enough of a signal for us to say we will always be able to trust it. Uh, if we see other signals that come into play, then we, we might ignore the rel canonical on, on a page like this. And that's something that happens on a per page basis. So not something where, at least as, as far as I know, we, we would do this on a per site basis and say, well, the canonical links on, on this website overall are wrong. Therefore, we'll ignore them completely. It's more that on a per page basis, we'll, we'll try to pick the canonical URLs that we think make sense. Um... I have a lot of excluded pages in my Search Console. My valid pages are about one-tenth the number of the excluded pages, and it's a big site with 170,000 valid pages. Uh, I'm wondering if excluded pages count towards our crawl budget. Once Google decides a page should be excluded from the index, does it still crawl the page periodically? Should I be concerned that the high ratio of valid to excluded pages is eating up our crawl budget? Uh, that's that's a good question and a complicated one, I think, uh, in the sense that, uh, yes, the excluded pages are counted in the crawl budget in the sense that when we try to crawl them and we end up not including them in the index, then we've, we've tried to crawl them. And they count as an attempted crawl and uh, essentially count in that uh, bucket of, of crawl budget. However, what usually happens is when we exclude a page for, for any particular reason, that could be because maybe it has a noindex tag on it. It could be maybe we have a duplicate URL and we pick a different canonical. Uh, then what generally happens there is we crawl these pages a lot less frequently. Uh, so while you might have a lot of pages that are excluded and we might be recrawling them from time to time. We'll be recrawling them a lot less frequently compared to the URLs that we think are important for your website. Uh, so on the one hand, they do count in the crawl budget. On the other hand, the effect within your site's crawl budget is generally minimal. Uh, also, when we have a number of URLs that we want to crawl for a website, and we also include a number of maybe excluded URLs or URLs that we're not sure about, and we run into a situation where we're limited by your site with regards to crawl budget, then we will try to prioritize the URLs that we think are more important uh, over the ones that are less important. Uh, so let's say in an extreme case, we can crawl 1,000 URLs a day from your website, and we know about 900 URLs that are good and about maybe 10,000 URLs that are from this excluded bucket. We'll try to get those 900 good URLs in first, and then the rest that we kind of have available there we'll, we'll pick from the excluded bucket just to make sure that we're not missing anything, that pages from the excluded bucket 
did not end up uh, suddenly becoming includable and in that maybe a no index is gone now and we can pick that up again. Uh, so yes, they're included in the crawl budget, but generally it's not something that you need to worry about there. OK, um, two really big questions. Let's see. Uh, I'm working for a travel agency. Uh, we have our main platform and some that revolve around the main one. The revolving ones are all linked to the main one, but they're not linked between each other and all have a different domain. Uh, the revolving ones spoke about the, the same thing, but ranks with different keywords and content. So the subjects in these are identical. It's all about travel. Uh, the content is different, but there can be similarities. My websites are all divided into continents, and we're speaking about a lot of countries and cities in those. So it can look like the same. We're talking about the same cities and locations in each of those, but worded differently, like if it was a different opinion on an identical subject. Um, let's see. So maybe before I get into the questions, uh, this sounds a lot like uh, something that you might want to watch out for in that uh, you're, you're creating a ton of content that can look a lot like doorway pages in that you're just kind of uh, switching different keywords across all of these pages here. Uh, so that's something where I, I would tend to be pretty cautious about just uh, running a system like this with so many different domains and sites. Uh, that essentially cover the same content. A lot of times what you'll find is that if you have fewer pages or fewer sites, you can perform a lot better in search because we can see that these are really important pages versus you're kind of diluting things across a lot of pages. Uh, so let's look at the questions. Um, my issue is that I'm using a pre-made theme, and I wanted to know if those would have an impact on the ranking of my websites. Uh, not necessarily. So whether or not you use a pre-made theme or a custom theme, that's essentially up to you. Uh, from a user's point of view, that might be something that users recognize. And maybe that's something where users will say, well, I don't know if I can trust this website if they're just using a theme that kind of came with WordPress by default. Uh, but that's essentially up to you. Um, let's see. The second question, this is also about having multiple websites. Um, would applying a nofollow uh, rule suffice? So I think it's basically between the different websites. Or should I do some kind of Jedi mind trick, like transforming those links into spans and using JavaScript to redirect to my domain? Um, so I think. In general, the links between these sites and pages is less of a problem than just the, the plain existence of so many variations. So I, I wouldn't worry about trying to hide any of the links between those sites. I, I would instead try to find ways to combine a lot of these sites and pages so that you don't have to have that many separate ones. Usually, having fewer sites means you, you can make those a lot stronger. You can concentrate your energy on, on those sites. Um, a question about JavaScript. Uh, if I can see my text in Google's mobile-friendly text, can I ensure that Google doesn't have a problem with reading and indexing my content and my pages? Uh, for the most part, yes, that's correct. Uh, there can be subtle is issues with regards to JavaScript. Uh, but uh, in general, the mobile-friendly test is something that uses the, the new uh, Chromium setup that we use for Googlebot. Uh, so if it works in the mobile-friendly test, it should work for, uh, for indexing as well. Uh, one of the things to watch out for here is that the mobile-friendly test as far as I know, it doesn't, uh, doesn't follow the, the robot's text rules. So that's something where you might want to use the Inspect URL tool in Search Console to make sure that actually your JavaScript files and your server responses and all of that are working well uh, from that point of view. Um, I changed normal images to Instagram embeds on one of my articles and saw a decrease in rankings, clicks, et cetera, for image search. Uh, it was a 43% decrease in image search clicks overnight on a very reliable article. 
Uh, can you talk a bit about the difference between normal images versus Instagram embeds from Google's perspective? Uh, so I, I thought that was an interesting question. And I created a, a test page to see how this actually works, because it, it really depends a lot on how Instagram sets this up, because you're essentially just taking code from Instagram and putting it on your website. And depending on how they set up that code on their end, it can have an effect on your website. So in general, what kind of the, the bigger picture change is you're going from a situation where the images are embedded in the HTML directly on your website, where they're really easy for us to discover and really easy for us to crawl and index, to a situation where we have to process some JavaScript and do some fancy processing to get to those images. So that, that means. It's, it's a lot more work for us to actually get to those images. Um, we can recognize those images, and we can crawl those images. Using the mobile-friendly test shows those embeds as well. So it kind of looks OK. Um, however, what, what I notice is specifically with the way that Instagram embeds these images, they use an iframe to embed kind of the post from Instagram, uh, which which kind of makes sense. Um, but with an iframe, you're basically adding another layer of interaction between your page and the images. So it goes from your page to this iframe, and then from the iframe content to your images. So that makes it a little bit harder for us to pick up those images. Uh, but what, what really kind of breaks the story for us is that within the content that is in, embedded from, from Instagram on with, within the iframe, uh, they use a no image index robots meta tag. And uh, this meta tag tells us that you don't want those images indexed uh, together with the page itself. So if we just look at that iframe content, we can recognize that there's an image there. We can crawl that image. But with that meta tag, you're basically telling us that you don't want this image indexed together with that landing page. Uh, so essentially, by switching from a direct embed of an image on your website to using Instagram embeds, uh, you're kind of telling us that you don't want these images indexed for your website. And uh, with that, I think it would be normal to see a significant uh, drop in image search traffic uh, to those pages, because you're essentially telling us you don't want these pages to be indexed like that. Uh, so uh, from, from my point of view, it essentially kind of comes back to, to you and kind of your preferences there. Uh, I can understand that sometimes it makes sense to embed Instagram posts directly or social media posts in general, uh, because you get a lot of added value from just kind of the, the whole everything around that with regards to comments and maybe uh, the likes and the shares and all of that information that is available within the embed. Um, on the other hand, it makes it a lot harder for us to actually Im index those images. So that's something that you almost need to balance on your side. Uh, do you need to have all of this extra detail around uh, the images? Or do you really need to make sure that those images are well indexed for your website? And uh, depending on the website, you might have preferences one way or the other. Uh, if you want to have both kind of the Instagram embed and to have your page ranking for those images, uh, then that will probably be tricky and might involve weird situations like having to put it in there twice. Um... Since a few months, we're seeing a new strategy where big news websites lease a whole subfolder or subdomain to a media company. Um, I think we've looked at this a few times here as well. Uh, so the kind of the question is like, this is spammy and I don't like it. And does a search team know about this? Um, we we do talk about this with the search quality team from time to time. And we, we do try to find examples where we think that things are kind of worse for users, and maybe also situations where we think that things are actually pretty good for users. Um, in general, I, I think 
the, these kind of changes happen from time to time in that people will find something that works really well for them. And it happens to work really well in search. And then suddenly, everyone does it. And then at some point, it becomes so, I don't know, kind of problematic in the sense that it's, it results in a lot more low-quality content. And then the websites themselves get seen as low-quality content, and things kind of settle down into a more reasonable place. Um, I, I, don't, I haven't looked at this situation for, for a while now, but I feel it's something where, where things will be settling down into a more reasonable place. And uh, in general, when, when it comes to changes like these, we, we try to avoid going down the route of manually kind of adjusting the rankings of individual websites because of these issues, uh, specifically when it comes to kind of topics where it's more about quality rather than pure spam, then we wouldn't have the web spam team go in there and say, like, we, we need to manually adjust the ranking of these websites. But rather, what we would try to do is algorithmically try to recognize the, the situation overall and kind of work out where the, the high quality, the useful content is within setups like this and uh, to, to promote that appropriately in the search results and to find places where our algorithms can automatically recognize that this is not so useful for users overall and to make those less visible in the search results. And sometimes this takes a little bit of time. Um, if a site has a fairly large volume of internal links, which generate 301 redirects to reach the final destination pages, will this impact crawl budget? Uh, I see Google regularly visiting the 301 redirect URLs and am assuming that placing the correct links to the destination pages would be better utilization of crawler resources and would speed up page load time significantly for users. Uh, this is a fairly large e-commerce site where these kind of links are regularly and repeatedly available 10,000 plus times. Um, in general, if we recognize that a page just bounces from one URL to another in the sense that we, we find a link to one URL and it redirects uh, directly to, to the next one, then that's something that wouldn't negatively affect the crawl budget in the sense that it's like we can process it right away. Uh, it can mean that we spend a little bit more time on, on a per URL basis to crawl this website. And uh, that can, in turn, still affect the crawl budget. So in particular, if we, if we recognize that we need, I don't know, so many seconds to actually get to the content, then we'll try to limit the number of simultaneous requests to that website just to avoid causing any issues. And if each request takes longer, then that, in turn, does mean that we are not able to crawl that much. So theoretically, that could play a role. Uh, in practice, it seems pretty rare. And uh, especially if you're talking about something like 10,000 pages, then for most websites, being able to crawl 10,000 pages especially if it's a fairly large e-commerce site, that's not something that would cause any issues there. So I think you probably see a small incremental change with regards to our crawling if you were to kind of link directly to the target pages. But you probably wouldn't see anything significant when you're talking about 10,000 pages. Uh, if you're talking about all pages within the e-commerce site, so maybe you're like always linking to a tagged URL, and from that tagged URL, you're redirecting back to a clean URL, and you have that millions of times across the whole website, then that is something where I'd say you probably would see a significant change in how much content we can crawl from that website uh, by fixing that, that setup. But if you're talking about 10,000 pages within an e-commerce site that has millions of pages, uh, then that seems fairly insignificant overall. Um, to increase the EAT of a medical page, should I use article schema, for example, or, for example, web page or medical web page, as the latter two has an option for reviewed by property? Or maybe Google can find that the article was reviewed from the context if I provide such details and schema property reviewed by is not necessary. Um, 
I, I think that's, that's kind of up to you. Uh, we, we do try to recognize kind of these additional details about information about the author, uh, information about the reviewers, about the, the website overall uh, through, through a number of ways. I'm partially through the content directly, so kind of similar to how users would see it if they go to the page and they see kind of information about who has reviewed this content or who has provided it, that's, that's really useful. Uh, if it's just like hidden away in structured data, then that's not very useful for users, because users tend not to use view source when looking at a page to determine whether or not they should trust it. Uh, so I, I would try to find an approach that works well primarily for users and focus on that. Uh, with regards to article or web page, that's something where I'm not exactly sure what, what the, the difference there would be. It seems that there's, like from a semantic point of view, they're slightly different. There's a bit of an overlap there, though. Uh, so depending on the page that you have, I, I would try to pick the appropriate uh, one there. Uh, so if you have an article, then maybe the article schema is the right one. Uh, if you have something more like a tool or a lookup or a forum or something, then maybe article is not the right, uh, right approach there. Uh, Google has a penchant for adding branding to title tags in search results uh, where there are none written on the site. Uh, for example, HubSpot has a guide to cryptocurrency without the brand name in the title, and Google added HubSpot to the headline in the search results. Is this purely aesthetic, or is there possibly more to it? Uh, for example, a signal that Google likes to see sites add branding to titles themselves. Um, so for, for the most part, we, we do this automatically because we find that it helps users to better understand the context of the individual pages on, that we show in the search results. and. Uh, a lot of times, I think we do a fairly well, fairly good job of that. Sometimes we we pick the wrong ones, and for those that we pick wrong, it's useful to get feedback on that. So if you see something weird happening with the title tags, then feel free to let us know about that. Uh, but it's not something where I would say you have any kind of a ranking advantage if you add the kind of a site title to your title tags, or any other kind of advantage there. Uh, it's essentially purely something that we end up doing for users. Uh, sometimes we also rewrite the titles. Sometimes we have to shorten them if they're on a mobile device, for example. The same thing happens with uh, the descriptions. Uh, sometimes we adjust them subtly based on the query that was made. Uh, so all of these things are aspects that we try to do to make it easier for users to understand how your page is relevant for them in their specific situation. And it's not a sign that you have to copy that and do the same thing on your pages directly. Um, I have a question about Google Analytics. Uh, for one of my clients under GA organic keywords, I see something like NP dash or NP dash user slash register. Uh, what could possibly be that I'm doing wrong in terms of tracking? Um, I don't know anything about Google Analytics, so I can't really help you with that. My guess is maybe you're, you're providing URLs to track on your own, uh, but I really don't know how, how those things end up in, in Google Analytics. Uh, we have a website with 50 million monthly page views. And when people search for our brand directly, they don't see site links nor the site link search box below our home page result. Uh, search Console detects the site link search box markup correctly, but it just won't show up in the search results. Does this mean that Google considers our site to be low quality? 60% uh, of our traffic comes from organic search, and the average session time is over four minutes. Uh, so no, it doesn't mean that we think your website is low quality. Maybe just first of all, uh, that's something that I, I really wouldn't worry about specifically with regards to the site links or the site link search box. 
uh, we, we show site links and the site link search box when we think that it makes sense for, for a site and for the queries that are going to the site. And it's not necessarily something that is tied to the quality of the website. Obviously, the website could still be low quality. So it's not that I'm saying your website is high quality. Uh, but uh, just because we're not showing site links or a site link search box is not a sign that we think the website is low quality. Uh, specifically to the markup of the site link search box, that's something where if we were to show a, a search box below the kind of, kind of the, the listing, then we would use the markup to show the version that you prefer to have shown. Uh, but it's not the case that just because you have the markup, we would be more likely to show that box. So it's still and kind of as a first step. If we were to show a site link search box, then we would use a markup. It's not that if you have the markup, then we would show the site link search box. Uh, my question is regarding multiple countries targeting for multiple products. Uh, if I have product one, which is in demand in the US, and product two, which is in demand in Canada, and there are other products for both countries, Oh, this is complicated. Uh, if I target product one, par product three, and product four in US, will it make it complex for Google to understand in which country I'm targeting my entire website? Um, usually, this is not, a, not an issue. Uh, so in general, when it comes to geotargeting, you can specify that in multiple ways. Uh, but it needs to be a clear section of a website. So uh, for example, you can say your whole site is targeting one specific country. Or you can say, I have multiple subdomains or multiple subdirectories. And if you list those separately in Search Console, you can specify the geotargeting for those parts individually. Uh, what you can't do is specify geotargeting for individual pages within your website. Uh, so kind of. With, with that out of the way, that, that kind of means if you have a shop with multiple products on it, then you would use geotargeting to specify the, the primary geotargeting of the website overall. Or you can use geotargeting to say, I, I don't want to have any geotargeting for my website. I just want to rank normally. And probably that would be the right approach here in that you, you're essentially a global website. And some products are more popular in individual countries, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, we'll try to rank them appropriately, but there's nothing special that you need to do there. Uh, so there's no special, special markup that you need to put on these pages to say, this product is specifically for the US, and the other product is specifically for Canada, and maybe a third product is global. Uh, we'll, we'll treat all of these products as being global and still try to rank them appropriately within the individual countries. Um, and a Google My Business listing question, which I don't really have any insight on. Um, in a recent Webmasters meetup, it was said that uh, the CCTLD is a, still a strong ranking factor. So does it doesn't mean that a .com website with a separate folder is not a correct practice? Uh, no. Uh, essentially, when it comes to geotargeting, we, we use two, two main factors uh, or two main ways to try to figure out the country. On the one hand, if you're using a country code top-level domain, then that's a pretty clear sign that you want to target that country. On the other hand, if you use a generic top-level domain, then you can specify that in Search Console. And both of these ways are equivalent. Uh, so if you have a generic top-level domain, you can specify the geotargeting uh, for the whole website. You can verify just a subsection of that site and set the geotargeting for just that subsection in Search Console. And all of that is essentially equivalent. Um, in, in practice, that means you, you can use the layer, the, the kind of the setup that you think works best for your website. Uh, but uh, there might be some maybe market-specific approaches that you want to look at as well in the sense that from an SEO point of view, like you can do all of these things. Uh, but from a practical point of view, maybe users in one country really 
prefer to see their own top-level domain in the search results, and they, they're really kind of cautious about the more generic ones. And then that's something where it's more a matter of marketing which, which setup that you use. Uh, sometimes it's also a matter of policy in that maybe if you're, for example, if you're targeting users in, in China, maybe there are some policy reasons where you'd have to say, well, I need to use a Chinese top-level domain because that's kind of what's required there. I, I don't know if that's the case, but uh, I could imagine there, there are situations that end up like that. John, I, I John don't know. can I just follow up on that question? OK. Um, so I, in current Search Console, I haven't looked, but so can you set up uh, forward slash US and target US and then forward slash UK and target UK? Can you do all that in the new Search Console? I think geotargeting. I, I think geotargeting is not yet in the new Search Console, so not. Okay. So, so you'd have to do that in the old one, but uh, you can. Oh, so you are, can yeah, you can kind of mix and match. Uh, okay. The the thing that you can't do is if you use domain verification, then that's only in the new Search Console. But if you have the subfolder verified, then that would be available in both of them. Okay. Yeah, hi, hi, John. Hi. Uh, so, John, actually, this was my question uh, regarding uh, geolocation. So, uh, a little different, uh, a little confusion was like best coffee shop in New York. One website is in New York or in USA, which is targeting US, and one website is in India, which is set up uh, country target in India. Then, how uh, geolocation works? Uh, basically, like somebody searching from India will see India site first. Possibly, possibly. So, uh, what what happens with geo targeting is when we recognize that a user is in one country and they're looking for something that seems to be specific to their country, then we will use geo targeting to promote the the local sites. Uh, so. In, there are a lot of situations where if you search, you're basically trying to search globally. If you're searching for an instruction manual on one product, then you don't really care which country that, that's from. And then geotargeting is not really a primary factor. On the other hand, if it looks like you're searching for something to buy, then maybe geotargeting should be a stronger factor. Uh, so that's something where if you're doing some a query that is kind of artificial, like best coffee shop in New York while located in India, then I could imagine that our systems get a little bit confused because they don't really know exactly what you're trying to do. Um, but uh, if you're searching for best coffee shop and you're located in one country, then we'll try to bring results from that region. Uh, so that's, that's kind of, I, I think, with that specific query example that you had and the location that you had there, then that's not really something that would map well to the general kind of user side of how, how users use geotargeting. Hey, hey, John, can I ask a question about the Google Search Console API? Sure. So uh, we're a site that's in the Alexa Global Top 1K. And around uh, the 1st of April, we've noticed that uh, hundreds out of the many thousands of sitemaps that we have uh, have since then been reporting incorrect uh, indexed data via the uh, the API. So in some cases, um, for uh, ever since early April, uh, the indexed count is the same, and, and we know for sure that that can't be the case. Um, uh, the indexed count in some cases is reported as zero, um, or in other cases, the indexed count just seems uh, wildly inaccurate. Meanwhile, the submitted count does seem accurate. And so uh, essentially, we posted on the webmaster forums asking for some insights into, into the issue and to see if others were, were facing a similar problem. But uh, we, we weren't able to, to gain much ground there. So uh, I was just kind of wondering what you think the next steps uh, should be for us. And, and perhaps maybe we could uh, escalate this issue, because it, it seems like uh, if there is some indexation bug or, or, or something around the, the API um, that maybe was resolved for most sites, uh, our site still seems to be affected. Um, that's unfortunately something 
in the API itself. So that's something where, at some point, when, when we switched over to the new UI for sitemaps reporting, I think they stopped updating that data in the API. Uh, so that's probably why you're seeing some stale data for some sitemaps and some zero data for some sites within kind of the indexing count there. Um, I, I need to talk with a team about kind of what, what the next steps there are. I know they, they've been looking into it and trying to find a way to resolve that. But I think it's been long enough that we need to at least document this state uh, to make it clear for people who are seeing this problem that this is not something that they're doing wrong, but rather we, we just aren't updating that data at the moment. I see. Is, is there any interim solution that we can employ, perhaps uh, submitting that uh, those sitemaps as, as new sitemaps um, or, or doing anything else differently that could enable us to get this data? Because uh, this data is pretty critical for us, and, and not having it for uh, a large portion of the sitemaps that we submit um, you know, is pretty unfortunate. I, I don't think so. I, I think at the moment, it's not being updated at all. So. Uh, for the sitemaps where you are seeing a number there, I suspect it's just the number that was there since April. And uh, for the ones where you're not seeing anything, it's basically we haven't added anything there. Uh, but I, I totally get your point. I, I know that this is something that others are using as well. So we, we should definitely find a way to get that data back in. I just don't have any ETA on that. So I, I think what will probably happen is we will try to get it updated, at least in the documentation, so that it's clear that this data is not available. And then in the next step with, with the API, where I know the teams are working on improving some things there, uh, that will get that back in. I see. And so despite some of the sitemap indexed counts seeming accurate and, and, and seeming like they're being updated, uh, it's the case that entirely for that uh, sitemap um, API, the index counts sh should be considered invalid entirely? Yeah, yeah. I, I would consider them invalid. OK. Yeah, sorry. OK, uh, no, no problem. Thanks for the uh, insight. Um, we still have a bit of time left. Well, actually, we don't have much time left. But I, I have this room for a little bit longer. So we, we can continue a little bit longer if you like. Uh, if there are any other questions that are on your side, feel free to jump on in. Uh, hey, John, we run the e-commerce business. So we have two listing pages. One listing pages will consider all the brand brands. The other listing pages is uh, only specific brand. The specific brand page is considered as duplicate. So how to eliminate that? And I want it to be indexed. Um, if, if we consider them to be duplicate, then that's probably because of the content on those pages. Uh, if they're about the same brand, then I could imagine that we, we might run into that situation. So uh, if you need to have them indexed individually, then I would make sure that the content is really significantly different. If you don't need to have them indexed individually, then I would pick one of those on your side and use the rel canonical to tell us which one of these versions that you want to have indexed. OK, done. Then one more question also. Is there any necessity to specify the domain name in the meta title and description? If there is no ranking advantage, so is it necessary? No, it's, it's not necessary. Some, some sites use the domain name as, as a brand name for the sites. And putting that in a title is fine, but there's no ranking advantage of using a domain name in the title or description. OK. Then one more thing also, like um, Google reads the image all text. So if suppose if I hover over an image and uh, I display the text, so is that Google reads it? or? Yeah, we, we do use the, the alt attribute for images. Uh, we use it as a part of the page for indexing the web page and for better understanding the image itself. OK, thanks. Wow, 20 people in here. Crazy. I guess this is one advantage of the new setup. More people can join in at the same time. Um, any other questions from any of you? 
Okay, John. Hi. Uh, yeah, so this is related to the domain diversity update, which was released in, I think, so June or July. So it was not top stories part of this uh, diversity update because what we see is most of the time the same news source is repeated two or three times within the top story carousel. Um, I I don't know for sure if top stories would be included in in that specifically because uh, a lot of times when when we have one boxes or kind of carousel elements there, then we we see those as separate parts of the organic search results page, not as the same thing as the normal listings there. So it's it's quite possible that top stories has its own set up for determining how how the diversity should be set up across the, the pages that we show there. Yeah, because it's not like uh, other sources are not covering that same topic. They are covering it, but still, I mean, the same source appears two or three times. So yeah, that's I, why I brought it up. Yeah. I, I don't know how, how top stories would, would deal with that. Uh, okay. I, nope. I, I do hear hear this from time to time. So if you have any specific examples or screenshots or something that you can post on Twitter and send my way, that, that would be useful to pass on to the team. It's sometimes a bit tricky with top stories because it's so specific to the location and the exact time when you do that query. Uh, so screenshots are, are really helpful for that. Sure, we'll do that. We'll do that. Cool. Uh, John, the same applies to PA also, not a part of that domain diversity update. To so to people invite, also ask. people also ask. Um, I don't know. Probably, I I don't know how how those results are are created. <laughs> uh, but that's also essentially a separate block. Uh, so generally speaking, they would have their own kind of internal ranking within that block. OK, let me double check the. Uh, yeah, please. Um, let me double check the submitted questions to see if anything new that we can add. Um, I think for most part we have things covered. What else is on on your mind? I had one query in my mind. Okay. So John, nowadays I am seeing that people have some strategy like uh, if if we want to shift to other domain, let us just redirect it for one year and we will leave it. In webmaster forum, I I am also seeing a lot of people discussing the same thing that we please tell me how for how long we should have this redirect three zero one and then we will leave it. Uh, how does Google really see if we have shifted this domain to or in the market or we have sold this domain and now links are still pointing to X domain which was earlier redirecting to Y domain? How Google determines later on that, yeah, this link equivalent to this, well, this link, why? Because six months back it was redirecting, so now it is also the link, you, link value should be passed to this. Uh, un unfortunately, if if you reuse a domain for something else, which could be either on your side or it could be that someone else has bought that domain, and we discover links to that domain, even if these are older links, then we will count those links as applying to the, the new domain. So it's not that we would say, well, this is an old link that was there when that redirect took place. Therefore, we'll ignore that link or pass it to the the website that has moved on, uh, it's really the case if you remove those redirects and we discover links to those old URLs, then we will probably try to apply them to the, the new website there. So it's not something that you would get to kind of like keep if you move to a new domain and you let the old one expire. Uh, because, because of that, that's something where I really recommend, on the one hand, going through and updating the links. Uh, kind of how we have that listed in the, the Help Center, and uh, also trying to keep that old domain for as long as possible. Uh, even if you're not using redirects anymore, just at least keep it 
within your own control so that you don't run into a situation that suddenly a competitor is taking your old domain and using it to try to rank their content. Uh, so if, if you're moving from one domain to another and set up permanent redirects, I try to keep them as permanent as possible. And in any case, I try to keep the old domain name so that it doesn't expire and end up being something completely unrelated. Yeah, of course. John, can I ask a quick question about uh, image links versus regular links? Sure. OK, because we or I want us to link to the other websites that we have, but showing the logo so it's more user friendly and that people can see it. Um, and not only have a text link to that domain name, uh, would it still be OK to have it, the link in the image? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, what, what I think is, is useful there is either that you have the text link as well, uh, okay. or at least that you use the alt attribute for the image to kind of give us the anchor text that you want associated with that link. So that um, the um, alt text can be the full domain name? Sure. OK. Yeah. OK, but you will also have a text under it. So it will be <laughs> linking with the image and then the text under. OK. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, Google is solving queries on its own, such as, what is the capital of UK? It is possible that the Google got to know about this from such as uh, such websites as Wikipedia and others. If Google will keep answering these questions without mentioning the website source, it is possible that in the future, Google is going to kill all the traffic to the webmasters who is providing such information about the persons and places. It's Google, is Google is thinking about the criteria of the, these kind of webmasters right now? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think that's, that's something that pretty much everyone on the search team uh, thinks about and tries to take into account. So uh, trying to find the balance between giving people information and making sure that the, the whole web ecosystem has a reason to remain kind of a, a thriving ecosystem, that's, that's something that we definitely think about a lot. I think there there are some some kind of queries where it makes sense to show information directly in the search results, and maybe others where it doesn't make that much sense. So, for example, if someone is looking for the opening hours of a business, then showing those opening hours doesn't cause any problems for that website in the sense that users aren't going to the website and clicking on that that page anymore to find the opening hours. But they find the opening hours, and they use these opening hours to go and visit the business in person. Uh, so for the business itself, clicks to that page are not really the, the critical aspect there, but rather kind of being visible in search and being findable and having their information available for users at the right time uh, so that they can then kind of make it have it a little bit easier to actually convert with that business and become actual customers. And uh, that's, that's one aspect there. The other aspect is, of course, if you have content that is very limited in the sense that uh, like you ask, what is the capital of India? And the answer is one word. Then if your whole web, web page is essentially just to answer that question, then of course that will be trickier. Because on the one hand, there's a lot more competition for those kind of pages out there now. And on the other hand, a lot of this information is, is general information that we can just show in search. Uh, so if the whole reason for being of your website is to answer kind of these one-word questions, then I, I do imagine that's something that you'll have to figure out on your side, kind of migrating the, the change in how search works, how, how the web works overall. Uh, but that's something that. From, from my point of view, is is normal as a normal part of the web in the sense that things evolve over time. The user needs evolve over time. The expectations change over time. Uh, and therefore, websites themselves also need to find ways to stay with the times and find ways to be unique and compelling so that users want to go to your web page and don't just want a one-word one answer. Uh, actually, uh, in recent uh, article uh, of Ryan Fishkin, He's saying that uh, the Google is providing, uh, answering the queries, 48% uh, uh, 
uh, without mentioning the source. Isn't it alarming to the webmasters? I, I did not read that article, though. It's really hard for me to comment on that. OK. Thank you. John, do, do you have a number of, um, or do you know a rough percentage of what queries you answer on the page rather than not? I don't know. I don't, I don't think we have a public number. I think it's also tricky to say <laughs> because some things are answered like, directly in a snippet on a page. And uh, that's, it's kind of hard to say that this is something that Google is doing differently versus maybe the, the answer is just in the meta description of the page. All right. I was just wonder because I suspect it's not a big issue. People just notice it. I, I, I imagine. It's a small issue. Yeah, I, I, I imagine it's, it's something that changes over time as well, depending on how people search, uh, what, what kind of questions people use to search. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where uh, I, I think user needs and user expectations change quite a bit over time. I, I think business expectations have changed as well. I think you, people now think you can monetize what's the capital of India, where 20 years ago, you look at it in a book or you ask someone else. There's no money to be made from that query. So people have got lucky for 20 years and maybe have made some money out of it. But things change. You can't make money out of everything. That's probably the case, too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, like Capital of India, I, I could imagine that for a long time you could make kind of ads, made for ads landing pages that worked really well in search for that. And that, like you said, for a, for a while, you could probably make, make a decent living just answering these basic questions. But uh, things change. And especially when, when it comes to, I, I think, bigger websites, that's something that has changed significantly as well, where in the beginning, uh, you could make a landing page on specific book topics or specific things just because there is no kind of general source of information on the web. And you, you could rank for those and perform really well. And nowadays, there are lots of different sites that are trying to compete for all of these queries. Yeah. I think, Axel, you're raising your hand. Yeah. Go uh, for it. My name is Axel from Germany. I'm managing a really old site where we have special chars in the URL. So like some editors created URLs with copyright names and uh, French accents, like Avan or Annex Julie. And I noticed that the GSC, the check URL tool, is not accepting the URL at the moment because it says it's wrong encoded. Could you investigate on that? Do you have some example URLs that maybe you can copy yeah. into the chat? Yeah, I, okay. I give you one in a minute. Then. So we have here one URL where the, um, the editor, the person, Basically, putting the product in the, um, the this one is it's a German site and there's a product and there's a percentage AE which is the copyright sign. This one I would say is not so legit, but there's another one where the brand name is called French Aven. There's also a famous toothpaste in Germany called Annex Gelee, which has an E. And so the content editor just types in the name of the brand, and the CMS is like converting the URL. And if you paste that into check URL, it's like not. OK. It's not yeah. Um, trying those in, in the browser also doesn't show the, the character, but um, it should at least load. So I, I'll double check with, with the team on that. In general, what we recommend for kind of non, I don't know, non-standard. I mean, these are standard characters, but kind of the, the non-ASCII yeah, characters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, the kind of special characters is that you use Unicode if you include them in a URL. Uh, yeah. That way, we can, we can always pick that up. Uh, but we should, I mean, if, if you can load this page in a browser, we should be able to uh, test it with the testing tools as well. Uh, so that's that seems like a bug on our side. The tool says at the moment URL is not in the correct format, and we are trying to switch our system from uh, ISO Latin one to UTF H. So it's going to be probably solved. Okay. So if you could pass it to the devs. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely pass that on. 
Thanks. Cool. Um, any last questions before we close out for the week? Everything good. OK. That's good. I, I think the, the indexing issue that we had yesterday should be mostly resolved now as well. So maybe we can go into the weekend with a little bit less stress. Uh, I, I hope the week has been good for you all, and I wish you all a great weekend. Thanks, everyone, and uh, see you next time. Bye. Bye.